Yeah, I mean, I think the level of of responsibility that a guide has, uh, the, the kind of skills that you would need to have and develop to be able to perform that ethically. It, it, there's like, to me, it seems that there's literally no protocols around this. Like people are kind of just make this shit up and <laughs> that people might have a, you know, a big reputation. They might be well known within the psychedelic community or world. And that's enough. It's like, I've heard of this person I've heard good things about them. I'm going to trust them. And I'm basically like a piece of uh, a putty in their hands. And that's, I don't know. It's, it's like wild to me because even though there can be some serious issues with, you know, modern psychiatry or, or psychotherapy or any of these things that we can talk about, there seems to be at least certain protocols in place and, psychedelics don't seem to have that right now so uh, yeah 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 just, they, just they like, don't yeah. have it right now and in fact mm, i would say as sort of a participant observer in the psychedelic underground there's a real reticence to have formalization protocols oversight people are not a lot of people who gravitate towards practicing an illegal form of therapy to begin with are not the people that are really excited about setting professional norms and adhering to them. Isn't there a bit of a contradiction, though? Because it feels like this whole psychedelic renaissance that is happening um, is about making psychedelics, not, not only to remove a taboo or stigma on psychedelic use in society at large, in Western societies, but... Um, to, you know, move to a path of decriminalizing it, to make it so it's a therapy that can be used. And that seems like if you're going to go down that path, it would mean that there would be some sort of guidelines, ethical guidelines set in place around this kind of thing. So it's an interesting, seems to me to be a contradiction. Well, sort of. I guess I, I see it a little <laughs> bit differently. Rick yeah. Doblin has talked about medicalization as a Trojan horse for legalization. And yet, as the billionaires and millionaires get involved with their different corporatelic firms and start to research novel chemicals and new interventions and new routes of administration that they can monetize, there's... There is a something we at Symposia talk about as like prohibition light... Because more and more, the, the conversation is not about decriminalization. It's about having legal sanctioned medical use and everything else is still illegal and criminalized. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that presents a whole set of issues because the underground practitioners will continue to practice in the underground. Like that's not going anywhere. Um, right. and, and I also think that like, even in a, if we were to take the situation right now as it's unfolding and imagine a context of, of like a post prohibition world of decriminalization, maybe coexisting with medicalization, I think there's an issue around psychedelic ethics as a grossly underdeveloped discipline. Mm, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you look at just in the broadest sense, you know, you pick up an academic paper and any given paragraph, you you know, or like in an, in an opening, it might be, you know, so-and-so in such and such year said this, but then this other person came along and said this other thing and like, wow, was that a shake up to the field? And then this other person came along and tried to sort of synthesize them. And then this person subverted it with the, there's like, there's a, a history of people who are trying to think through an issue in conversation with each other, um, presenting different ideas and debating those ideas. And it's like, I remember I went to, um, I think it was the Psychedelic Sciences 2013 conference in Oakland, California. And I got so excited because Julie Holland was going to be giving this talk on psychedelic ethics. And I was like, oh, thank God. I'm so excited. Like, this is a conversation I think is so important. And I went to the talk and it was like every three slides was like a picture of like a leaf or like some dirt. 
And, you know, so she spaced up her like information slides with like, now let's look at a tree. And then she got to the very end and her conclusion was that psychedelic research is ethical, that like it's the ethical thing to do because of the veterans and because of the people who are suffering and because of the, Mm. and I just, I was so disappointed. I was like, this is it. This is what you have to say for psychedelic ethics is that psychedelic research is, is, is ethical. Like there are, I was, I was in my mid twenties and I had been to the Amazon and I had had negative experiences and I had seen a lot of people acting in ways that seemed unethical and poorly considered and problematic. And I was like, there is such an important conversation to be had here and it's not happening. How is this not happening? This is the psychedelic ethics talk. This is what y'all got. Um, and I, I have to say like the field hasn't come much further. Um, there was an article that came out in 2020 or 2021 by Smith and Sisti. And one of the points they, and like no shade on them for, for what they, you know, wrote about it. They wrote like three paragraphs about touch in psychedelic sessions. They, there's not many citations there because there's nobody to really cite. And it's like this really cursory kind of brief consideration of this like massively complicated and complex topic that like me and some of my colleagues could write reams about. Mm -hmm. Um, and here it is just getting this three paragraph treatment. And like, there's, there's no other literature in the field to like really point to as far as what's ethical and what's acceptable and what are the norms. So I think one of my beliefs at the moment is like we need rigorous psychedelic science we need rigorous debate um we need really in-depth consideration of some of the intricacies and identification of problems and pitfalls clinically and in our research methodologies um in order to you know have any hope of finding a sound path forward Yeah. Well, when, because I, I, I was listening to that podcast series, Power Trip, and I don't know if it's in there. I believe it is. When you first started to speak out about your personal experiences um, and really criticizing this, these spaces and what, what happens in them. I, I I don't know. I, I just want to ask about this because there's this is something that's I'm sorry. There's so many uh, people who experience uh, you know sexual assault. Uh, they experience this a lot, which is um, you know it's called victim blaming. Um, I guess I'll ask you if you could talk about the ways in which the psychedelic community has attempted to to do just that um sure yeah. i mean my yeah. phd was very focused on understanding uh victim blame around sexual violence in the context of neoliberal capitalism so um no. okay. i can speak to this for a long time and if i'm rambling just you know no cut in. no but, please um go for it but i think there's a couple of things i would say that c come to bear on this one the sort of lowest hanging fruit would be um, this concept called just world theory. It's basically the idea that bad things happen to bad people and good things happen to good people. Mm. And it has a, a function psychologically because I think a lot of what I, the emotional experience that I had when, when encountering victim blame, which was frequent and everywhere um, was this feeling like people were trying to make it clear that what happened to me would never happen to them because they're not that kind of person that would have that kind of experience, mm. right? And so mm -hmm. that that was like, there was a lot of sting to that. Um, that, was, mm -hmm. that was pretty pervasive and kind of pretty basic. There were some much more, I think, in some ways, like interesting um, – things that were also going on, which is like in the context of late capitalism and neoliberal capitalism, 
like it's not just an economic system. It's also a, an ideology and it's an ideology that promotes personal responsibility. And you combine that with like the women's liberation movement, um, where, which really emphasized women's sexual liberation, which you can kind of look at that and be like, who did that really benefit? Because it certainly posed some benefits for men as well as women. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's this idea that goes along with that, that women have sexual agency and that that sexual agency both allows for them to pursue the sex they want, but also to deny the sex that they don't. So it's therefore woman's responsibility to assert her boundaries and her agency by saying no and being clear about the sex that she doesn't want. Um, and the baseline is that it's not that simple. <laughs> um, you know, the research that we have about um you know, men's willingness to engage in sexually coercive behavior and the, um, the intentionality or some of the strategies that, um, coercive men will use in order to engage in acts of sexual assault and sexual violence, um, mm -hmm. are pretty mind blowing and, and confronting, you know, I think it's, I think it's a lot easier to, in our society to focus on blaming the victim rather than acknowledging that like, Oh, like, gosh, you know, some people are really, they're willing to disregard what other people's wants are and their bodily autonomy in pursuit of getting off. Like mm -hmm. that's a dark thing to have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a lot going on. And I think one of the things that was very unique to the psychedelic community, or at least I started seeing it sort of that way, but then in the context of this kind of neoliberal understanding, my view really expanded. And that is the idea of post-traumatic growth. So not only are we supposed to avoid being a victim, because the victim label has been recast in the last couple of decades, it, it really, instead of meaning, like, victim really should connote that something bad, like victimizing happened to a person. Mm -hmm. And instead we talk about victims as like a characterological feature as if like a person with a victim mentality, like that victimhood is, is inherent to the person who's been harmed, not a function of like events and experiences that they had that were out of their control. Mm -hmm. And so, um, this idea of post-traumatic growth comes in because there's this additional expectation that if one does experience victimization, which let's be real, sexual harm is a form of victimization that is like widely tolerated in our culture. It's a social and cultural problem yeah. uh, and it's pervasive. But this post-traumatic growth thing then says, okay, now it's your job as an individual to find benefit in adversity and grow yourself through the traumatic experience as though like, okay, so you've been traumatized. So now there's an expectation for self-improvement and a healing journey to become a survivor, to become a non-victim in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that comes to bear in psychedelic spaces. I mean, I wrote a whole section of my thesis on the journey metaphor, and I actually wasn't thinking about psychedelics. It's, it's really prevalent in, in the qualitative literature and the way victims and victim survivors talk about their post-victimization experience is this journey away from victimhood and towards survivorship. And then I came back to the psychedelic community. I was like, oh my God, this language of the journey is freaking everywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't just mean like the journey session. I mean like the wider shamanic healing journey that is, uh, yeah. you know, life yeah. or whatever. Anyway, I, I hope I'm making some sense, but I you think are. the baseline yeah. is just that, um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in psychedelic spaces on individual healing to transform the world. And a lot of, I think, the trauma that people, especially women and non-binary folks and queer folks are trying to heal in psychedelic spaces and men, there's plenty of male victims of sexual harm. Um, it is sexual harm. It is sexual trauma. Um, and, and it bothers me that it's, it's that dealing with the consequences of this profoundly social problem is foisted onto the shoulders of the individuals who have suffered. Mm. Yeah. 
End of rant. <laughs> no, yeah. And there was one element to it that really stuck out to me in the in Power Trip, which was people coming to you or to other victims and saying, if this is talked about too openly, then this will get in the way of our our long-term goal of, you know, destigmatizing psychedelics. Like if people start associating psychedelics again with bad things, bad things happening to people, then we won't get it legalized, we won't get it decriminalized, and, and so on. Yep. And it's really <laughs> unfortunate because I think if we learn anything from some of the university scandals and the Harvey Weinstein scandal and like the Me Too movement, the thing that makes it a scandal isn't even the fact that sexual violence happened. It's the cover up. Mm. And I think, I think that's, Maybe that may be the sort of direction that things are moving in the psychedelic space as more people come forward with stories and more accounts of atrocious responses to victims. Um, I've spent a bit of time in my career looking at um, institutional responses to sexual harm and, and disclosures, like uh, some of the research about um, how to respond to disclosures and you know, there's there's a whole field of specialists in sexual violence prevention and developing institutional responses and policies and training people in workplaces to, um, you know, be more prepared to respond to reports or allegations of sexual harm. There's, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Kayla Stewart, really thinking about what some of those procedures in workplaces could look like. Um, and by no means are we the only ones, you know, we're drawing on, um, you know, existing work and best practice research in, in those spaces. And I think, you know, within psychedelics, like there's no need to reinvent the wheel. I, I was in a talk um, a couple of years ago and somebody in the audience was saying, oh, we need to be so gentle with ourselves. Um, you know, this, we're all, we're just, we're new to kind of figuring this, the sexual harm stuff out. And, you know, it's really difficult. And, and I, and I told them like, with all due respect, like gentleness for sure. And also there is a whole body of work in feminist sexual violence research that dates back decades that we could be learning so much from, you know, I, I strongly discourage psychedelic people from trying to reinvent the wheel or think that there's something totally, you know, unique or superior about this community that, that somehow it need not learn from, from some of the great thinkers uh, that have come before and really charted out some very useful ways of thinking about these issues and some very practical ways of dealing with them. 